Hello, ladies and gentlemen. We're back with you again with uh, Community Camera. I uh, have as my guest today a gentleman from the State Department, the second in a series of visitors from the State Department to Corning Community College. Happy to welcome today Mr. Quinlan. Uh, you go by uh, Pat, I guess. Is that... Uh, C.J. Patrick Quinlan. My name, I'm usually called Pat, yes. Welcome to the program, sir. I thank you very much. Wally. You've had a, a, certainly a varied experience of, a, of assignments with uh, the department as Foreign Service Officer. I, I notice uh, that you have been responsible for uh, opening uh, three posts abroad. Uh, what were those? Kaduna and uh, Sana'a and Muscat. Kaduna, northern Nigeria and West Africa. Sana'a is the capital of northern Yemen in the Arabian Peninsula. And Muscat is the capital of the Sultanate of Oman on the Indian Ocean on the other side of the Arabian Peninsula. Rather exotic uh, connotations to some of those names. They're off what is for most of us uh, the beaten path at any rate. Uh, we're, uh, I might just explain to the viewers that you are, uh, as I said at the uh, start of the program, the second of our visitors from the State Department. And it's part, it seems part of a concerted program to uh, communicate the uh, goals and methods of, of the of state more fully to the at the grassroots level is this correct it's uh, it's more than that Walter it's an effort to communicate explain our policies to the American people but also a means of getting to know more about what the American people think uh, we don't conduct or we don't advise on foreign policy in a vacuum after all when a recommendation is made to the president who does make foreign policy it should be based not simply on what we might dream up in Washington, but uh, based on what the American people think should be happening. There's very often a, a major difference between Washington thinking and thinking in, in the Middle West, in the Far West, in fact, anywhere outside of Washington. So this is a means of getting me as an individual an opportunity to talk to people, to answer questions, and uh, to discuss the nuts and bolts and, and policy. So it is really a, a two-way kind of communication. Uh, you're, out, you're out listening as well as talking. At, Absolutely, uh, and learning, yes. And, and I noticed that so far, at least with my experience with this, the, the, the people doing it are, are field types who are, who are being rotated back on stateside assignment, but, but put out. Mm -hmm. Uh, in this manner to get the, the contact with the public. Yes, indeed. I'm assigned as diplomat in residence for one year, uh, headquartered at Oakland University in Rochester, Michigan, but with the mission of talking to students and faculty members at as many colleges and universities as I can reach during my year. It gives me a year away from operations to do some thinking, perhaps some writing, uh, reflection, and uh, we think it's as good service to the community as it is to the State Department. What, uh, what are your duties at, at Oakland? Do you have regular lecture assignments, or, or are you, is it a more intermittent kind of thing? Well, I'm very proud of my title, Adjunct Professor of History. But in fact, since I'm not a historian, all I can do is play at being a teacher. Uh, last semester, as this semester, I assist in teaching a class. I give occasional lectures. I help conduct discussions. And uh, I answer every possible request from other colleges, other universities in Michigan, uh, Illinois, Indiana, as well as this special program in New York to which I was assigned by the Department of State in Washington. Well, of course, from my perspective, there's no higher calling than to be a <laughs> professor of history. So congratulations I on thank you. promotion. <laughs> Uh, I would like to um, uh, talk to you, I guess, today about two major parts of the world, and, and uh, then maybe we can uh, roam even more widely if the time permits, but they're, they're big subjects, and I, I, I think I'll start not necessarily in your, uh, uh, in the area you spent the most time, but um, I thought maybe with uh, Deng's visit and all of the talk about China right now. We might start off with China. Uh, the, it's had almost a surrealistic tinge. Uh, I, I think we, 
We know that China is important and that there are almost a billion people there and that in the power balance in the world today it would be folly to ignore them and yet it's all happened so quickly. It, it seems to me the, the view of, of Premier Tang down in Houston with his cowboy hat, even two or three years ago, would have seemed inconceivable. How has it all come about in such a, a compressed time frame? The announcement in December was a bit of a surprise, I think, to most, to most of us, including those in the Department of State. But in fact, the process of normalizing our relations with the Chinese people has been going on ever since President Nixon opened the door, so to speak, many years ago. This was seven, over seven years ago. Uh, during this period, it's become abundantly clear, I think, to Congress and to the American public that ultimately we would have direct diplomatic relations with uh, the Republic of China, the mainland China, and that our relationship with the government of Taiwan would inevitably change as our relationship with the mainland China changed. In a way, we were backed into a corner with regard to Taiwan since both parties claim that there's only one China. Uh, it, it, it's rather difficult to, for us to take any other position. Uh, that there should be a separate Taiwan is, is something that even the Taiwanese theoretically have not maintained, isn't that correct? They've also said there's only one China. This is an extraordinary thing. The, um, the most fervent supporter, supporters of the one China theory are to be found in these two places, mainland China and the island of Taiwan, yes. So there doesn't seem to be any place to go except to recognize one or the other. And we've made the choice now, or, or changed our choice, and I guess, do you think there's reason to hope that, um, that mainland China will, will not be precipitous in, in trying to use force to, uh, to bring about? Mm. Well, there's ample reason to believe that, and not only the, the uh, statements of Vice Premier Deng himself, but the fact that uh, China does not have the military resources to do anything at the moment but accept the uh, continued presence of another government in Taiwan. And there's no reason to think that the Chinese, uh, the communist Chinese government could possibly change this military balance in the space of a few years. It would seem with their anxiety over that long Sino-Soviet border that to risk the commitment of forces uh, in an amphibious operation, which I agree they're not at the moment prepared for, and to risk possibly an embarrassment there, uh, which would certainly lower their, their stock in the face of Russia, I guess that would be a risk they wouldn't want to take right now. I hope. I hope that's... Bad. Well, the military problems would certainly be considered. The, um, the space of water between Taiwan and the mainland is oh, about 120 miles, which is five or six times the distance of an English Channel. And, even Hitler, at the uh, height of his power in World War II, hesitated in thinking about the, the difficulties in crossing this 20, 25 mile stretch mm -hmm. of water. The, national, the uh, Chinese on Taiwan have excellent defensive weapons supplied by the United States. They have a commitment from us to continue to supply them defensive weapons, whereas the uh, communist Chinese have no amphibious force, have uh, no weapons which would permit them to uh, cross the space of water in the foreseeable future. And as you said, I think the uh, primary reasoning uh, behind our confidence that there'll be no invasion is that the communist Chinese are preoccupied with their border with Russia. Yeah, I would think and hope that that's the case. Uh, one of my guests uh, a few months ago was William Manchester, who, whose MacArthur book had just come out at that time, and I've just finished reading that, and uh, MacArthur makes, uh, of course, uh, again and again impressive points about uh, the difference between operations on the continent of Asia, which he felt we shouldn't get involved in if we could avoid mm -hmm. it, and, and on the other hand, our strength when it came to the islands and the amphibious kind of operation. So I guess that's going to be a built-in deterrent to China for some time. And Deng mm -hmm. has kept emphasizing that while he, while Formosa or Taiwan is part of China, that he, he keeps emphasizing his patience and their willingness mm -hmm. to wait. I also noticed while he was here, and I'm sure this was to, um, uh, to um, 
quiet some f fears that this thing might move too fast. He seemed to make a point uh, at several occasions of saying that the collective security and the, and the stabilizing and peacekeeping that he feels this new Sino-American relationship will, will augment can be done without formal treaties and alliances. He, he seemed to mention that on several occasions. That this peacemaking between um, mainland China and... Well, that, that, that the United States and China can cooperate toward those goals without mm -hmm. formal treaty bonds. Ah, uh, yes. <clears throat> There's been no talk, for example, about any kind of mutual uh, defense treaty, nothing of that sort. And in the statement of principles which accompany this normalization of relations between our government and the Chinese was a very specific, a very, very clear statement that neither party uh, had any uh, notions of uh, asserting hegemony in Asia. The that is to say, word. not only us, we could hardly do that, but also not the Chinese. Mm -hmm. uh, they, if, if we're to take that at face value, and I really don't see too much reason at this point not to, it looks as though China would like the, the security of fairly stable international situation to do a lot of internal reworking of their system. Precisely. They couldn't possibly accomplish the modernization objectives which they have proclaimed if uh, at the same time they were embroiled in local problems with a section of their own country, that is to say, uh, what they claim to be a section of their country, Taiwan. Aside from the immediate Far Eastern implications of our new posture relative to China, there is an important advantage, isn't there, for us internationally in the sense of the, of the shattering of, of any last remaining uh, view of world communism as a monoblock. I noticed Castro, for example, was uh, extremely bitter uh, about this new development. Mm -hmm. Certainly, it represents our point of view that communists are not the same all over the world. But also, and this is uh, my personal opinion, uh, it also represents the removal of an anomaly and abnormality in our conduct of foreign relations, which has made us difficult for other peoples to understand. We're virtually the last, and certainly the last major country to recognize China, to normalize relations with China. We spent a long, long time being odd man out in the situation. Uh, if foreigners fail to understand, foreigners fail to understand why the United States had this, what seemed to them, very peculiar view of one fifth, one sixth of the world's people, was well, certainly give an air of uh, more rationality to our foreign policy in general, to our posture in the world. So that right now we seem to be a little more in tune with the rest of the world in a, in a number of ways, with the Vietnam business receding, the past, uh, the new relations with China, uh, the fact that we're not currently involved in any direct military actions uh, abroad. It, it, the situation seems to be looking up as far as our world image right now. Certainly, I think we're easier to understand. Our policies are easier to understand now than they have been for decades. I uh, w go down to Mexico frequently, and that's uh, one of the few foreign countries uh, that I really feel that I know a little bit about. And I think this, this time, and I have many friends down there, so I, I do get some of the, the, uh, the real Mexican view, uh, frankly stated, because it's been, I've heard it when the criticism was very frank, but I haven't, it's been years since I've found as receptive an attitude toward the United States in Mexico as there was this year. Just seemed to be a I'm delighted to hear that. And I think it's partly because, um, well, the incidentally, the China thing was what made me think of that. They, they feel, as you said, that we had been just uh, playing an ostrich, really. Mm -hmm regard to our China policy. Well, the, uh, do you think there will be uh, much change in the internal uh, climate in China under Deng? Will there be any retreat from what to most of us would seem that oppressive 
um, uniformity of, of Chinese collectivism. Is that going to start easing, do you think? Well, I can only speculate that in, in the field of China, internal policies on the basis of what I read in, uh, in the newspapers and see on television, of course, but it certainly appears there's been a genuine breakthrough in terms of expression of the popular will. I was amused to, uh, since I'm on a college campus, <clears throat> one of the first things I did was look around at the walls. I was amused to hear the other day that uh, wall posters have become the vogue in Chinatown in San Francisco. Now, do you suppose that every college campus will be plastered with posters uh, over the coming know. month? Maybe that'll become our way of expressing views on a new folk art the world, has know. been given to the world. Yeah. <laughs> do you? Um, uh, one, I, uh, before we go to a different area, I, uh, on this um, one final observation on this China thing, uh, uh, were you surprised uh, that Deng's visit, uh, just concluded, uh, went by with as little show of, of opposition demonstration? Now, there were a few incidents, but were you surprised there wasn't more, or did you expect it to go that Well, we're in the late 1970s now, and I suppose uh, we shouldn't expect anything like the violence of the 60s, but even so, considering the uh, that a number of public men have expressed opposition to this new policy. One might expect, therefore, the radical left or right to express this uh, opposition more violently. I, I really thought it might bubble up more forcefully. I don't know how much of an issue it's going to be in the next presidential election, but I, I very much suspect those who are hoping to make it a point of attack in the Carter administration are going to find by 1980 that it's become a point of strength, and I don't think they're going to make much mileage out of it. There's been some uh, non-factual opposition to the treaty. For example, the use of the word abrogate is generally used. Mm -hmm. Well, in fact, <clears throat> we were very careful not to abrogate our treaty with Taiwan. Mm -hmm. We did not abrogate it, and we informed the Chinese we would not abrogate it. The treaty contained a phrase saying that either party could terminate, end the treaty, end the agreement on giving a year's notice, which is what we did. So that it didn't actually it violate... Didn't, it didn't uh, break anything, uh, it didn't violate anything, no. Uh, uh, I, I think that some of the complexity of the situation was in a, in a microcosm was, was illustrated out when they said that at one point outside the White House, there were three groups demonstrating against Deng's visit. The Maoists, the, the pro-Taiwan uh, the pro uh, Taiwan group, and, uh, and uh, also a, a, a Taiwanese native group that wanted them both to leave. <laughs> they didn't want either China. Uh -huh. uh, going to the Middle East, um, uh, certainly, uh, the question at the, at the moment we're we're meeting today that's most pressing there is the Iranian situation, and uh, and my question, I guess, the first question I have is uh, is not so much what will happen in Iran because that again is awfully hard to uh, to speculate on, but what effect will it have on the rest of the uh, of the Near Eastern countries, uh, the Arab and Muslim Near East, uh, Iran was um, under the Shah was something of a moderating influence. It, what, what will be lost under this? Aside from what may be lost to our interest in Iran, what's it going to do, in your opinion, to the uh, neighboring Muslim state? Well, quite apart from what has already, from what might happen in Iran, and we can. None of us could do more than speculate on this. Uh, there will certainly be uh, clear effects of this on Israel, on Islam, on the Muslims in the Middle East. The opposition to the Shah was crystallized, uh, was provided with a catalyst in the person of uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini. Well, uh, Islamic fundamentalism represented by Khomeini has been on the rise now for some time, not only in Iran, but elsewhere in the Middle East. There have been uh, new expressions of Islamic belief, of Islamic practice in Egypt, for example, in Pakistan. 
uh, and other countries in the world. There's no question but that the success of Khomeini in exploiting this wave of feeling will give uh, heart and courage to the Islamic fundamentalists in other countries, which may represent not much more than a change, for example, in, uh, in fundamentalism in the United States among Christian sects. There have been a number of new sects yeah, and forms of religious comparison. expression have arisen here. These are born-again Muslims, uh, perhaps. <laughs> that we're the, yes. uh, the uh, effect on Israel of, is certainly one of the main concerns uh, that our policy has. Uh, with the Egyptian settlement dragging and, uh, and no end, immediate end in sight, and, uh, and this uh, growing Muslim um, extremism, if that's an acceptable adjective, but what, is this going to set things back in general as far as a, as a settlement between Israel and its neighbors? I'm afraid it'll make a difference, more of a difference in uh, Israeli thinking than it would to the, um, to the Muslims, to the Arabs. Uh, the Arabs would certainly welcome a new uh, expression of Iranian solidarity with, the, with their Muslim brothers in the Middle East. Uh, and they might even hope for military assistance from Iran. But I suspect the most immediate effect will be to make the Israelis even more cautious than they have been in negotiating a settlement. Uh, they will have presumably lost their access to Iranian oil, which can be replaced, but perhaps at a cost. And they will have lost the unspoken expressions of, of uh, friendship between Iran and Israel. And uh, what about the settlement itself? Is that still salvageable, uh, or is it just going to keep being postponed uh, indefinitely? That's a hard uh, question. Uh, the one generalization one can be sure of is that all possible solutions to the Middle East, to the Arab-Israeli dispute, are certain to be ruled out by either party the moment they're broached. However, we've made progress in the past when the uh, way has seemed to be blocked on all sides. I'm sure we will. Ambassador Atherton has just uh, finished a shuttle between Cairo and Tel Aviv, in which uh, closed with the decision that there wasn't anything he could do at that particular moment. However, times will change as they have in the past, and we're sure the Israelis and Egyptians will come together again. It seems that the main uh, decision that the Israelis are, are making, and I guess this is fairly obvious, is whether to, <coughs> pardon me, whether to give up some of these territories that they have um, been uh, obtained in the result of past war uh, and rely on treaty guarantees and protection that uh, of, of, uh, of some new settlement, presumably with some American guarantees, or whether they want to, or whether they feel that their security depends more on, uh, on maximizing every territorial and strategic and military advantage uh, in in contemplation of uh, another possible war. And that's a difficult, obviously a difficult decision for them mm -hmm. to make. Israeli and American national interests are not necessarily identical in every respect, even though we have a deep and abiding commitment to Israel. Our commitment to Israel is to the existence and the permanent security of Israel. Our commitment is not to the present borders of Israel or to any particular borders of Israel. And uh, perhaps our major long-range difference with the Israeli government and people is that we think Israel should concentrate on permanent security, which can come only through peace with Israel's neighbors, rather than on the details of any particular border delineation. Yes, and, and I think that's a good point. Uh, certainly, as with any ally or, or client state, and, I, and I, I suppose that's an expression which would certainly draw objections, but there is something of that relationship. Uh, that does not assume uh, a complete endorsement of the of the national goals of that state, and I think this is being made more specific in recent months than it than used to be the case. Uh, I uh, 
your, your point of, of, of how you divide that, I think, is interesting. In other words, our, our commitment is to the continuance and, and, and to some basic security of the state of Israel, but not necessarily to its other specific goals. Exactly. Yes. Territory and so on. It, it seems to me, and I guess uh, as someone looking at it from the outside, it's easier to make these judgments, but it seemed that this Egyptian, uh, this Egyptian um, undertaking uh, to, to, to go into this kind of a new relationship to Israel was, would in the long run seem to me to be far more important than exactly where those lines were drawn. Exactly. Modern weapons being what they are, <clears throat> modern uh, warplanes and missiles being available to both parties, the difference between even, even 50 or 100 miles of, of border means relatively little. Uh, when compared to the potential for destruction, which is in the hands of either party. Just as a, a concluding thought here, I see our time is running down very rapidly, as it always does on these half-hour sessions. What was your, what was your most uh, rewarding post, the one that perhaps you remember with most personal uh, intensity and satisfaction? It would certainly be one of the three posts which I've opened up myself with my wife. Um, I think the most rewarding post was the most romantic of them all. Uh, my wife and I moved to Muscat, Oman in 1974, I rented an old Arab castle on the uh, historic romantic Muscat Harbor across the uh, 50 yards away from a, uh, a Portuguese fortress built in the 14th century remodeled the house into an embassy and a residence, and then spent uh, 18 happy months touring the countryside and getting to know uh, an Arab world which had been out of touch with the modern world for decades and decades and decades. That sounds like uh, uh, a posting that w you would remember. I grew up as a boy reading an author called Richard Halliburton, who <clears throat> sailed and flew about the world performing marvelous deeds. Well, I haven't performed any heroic uh, w deeds of wonder, but uh, I've had the experiences that I dreamed about as a small boy. It's been very rewarding. It sounds as though you might recommend Foreign Service as a career for someone leaving college. I hope to have a chance to talk to the students of Corning College about that today. Good. I'm sure they'll enjoy hearing from you, and I want to thank you very much for being our guest today on Community Camera. Where are you going after Corn? Uh, I'm going to uh, Binghamton, New York uh, tomorrow to Broome College and then back to um, Oakland University in Michigan. Well, I hope you enjoy your, your travels in the, in the States. Uh, how long are you going to be back? Uh, We're due for another assignment this summer and where we might go, whether Washington or abroad, isn't known. Uh, well, thanks again for coming on Community Camera. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been talking to uh, Mr. Pat Quinlan of the Foreign Service uh, and uh, sharing some of his opinions on, on especially Far Eastern and Near Eastern developments uh, currently in the news. Thank you all for tuning in. Please uh, stay with us for uh, further programs, including our visiting scholars coming up. Uh, we'll be having uh, Ben Wattenberg and Buckminster Fuller and Gay Talese and others as guests uh, in the next uh, weeks. Thank you all for tuning in.